Prime Minister Scott Morrison has warned Australia risks tumbling into a damaging recession under a Labor government. Today, he was promising an alternative, job creation and the eradication of debt. Yeah, these comments were hotly debated, mm. though, especially given jobs were already really predicted to grow and the threat of recession could be a stretch, depending on who you ask. But was this an effective piece of pre-election politicking for tonight's Taking Stock? We're joined by John Winning, founder of Appliances Online, also CEO of Winning Group, and John Rolfe, cost of leading editor at News Corp. John, John, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Um, John Rolfe, what do you think uh, of the news today? Big recession warnings all over the headlines, um, but Scott Morrison saying he's got the answer. This is going to be a very, very different election campaign to the last one. Uh, the coalition will go super negative. Our first ever marketing PM is going to pull out all stops to ensure that they give themselves every chance of winning by scaring the bejesus out of the public uh, about a Bill Shorten-led government. It is their one and only chance of avoiding a massacre and they still have absolutely no hope. They will get demolished and they deserve to because uh, they saw uh, the schmozzle that was the Rudd-Gillard-Rudd years and then did exactly the same thing. The best thing that could happen for Australia is anyone to run this place for six years without interruption yeah. and to get rid of half of the Senate. And so far, neither side can promise to do that. So no. it's going to be the, the worst. But if I was Scott Morrison, this is what I would be saying too. Because yeah. I do think that they've got a pretty good story to tell in this area. People do, um, people I guess of, uh, of my age and older, uh, remember coming out into a, into a um, work environment for the first time where employment was, unemployment was over 10%. And it was scary. I thought I'd have to take any job that I could get. Mm. But people younger than me haven't lived through that. They are living through their own challenges. I'm, mm. I'm not saying it's any uh, more, uh, it's any easier for them than it was uh, for people of my age and, uh, and older, but I do think that this is the strongest suit for the Coalition and their only hope. Yeah, at the age of 36, the 27 years that we have, you know, haven't seen a recession before, I was certainly in primary school the last time, so I think, I think it was a pretty good line, personally. Mm. John, what do you reckon? Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, unfortunately, most Australians have lost faith in both sides and I think we feel like we're damned if we do and we're damned if we don't and what we keep finding out is as we're damned, we swap and swap and swap and I think, unfortunately, the yeah. Liberal Party kicking out two Prime Ministers that weren't even voted in or replacing them with two, two Prime Ministers that weren't voted in doesn't restore us with a lot of faith in the Coalition. Uh, I also was reading a, a, lead, a book on leadership yesterday and it said that great leaders avoid bagging the competition and really take the higher ground and I think that this tactic is not one that I would support. Um, however, you know, as John said, it is probably their best hope and I just think we're not in a great time at the moment and both sides probably not taking the higher ground and yeah. probably not having any more confidence than the other. John, you're a, you're a CEO, you employ lots of people. Um, what does it feel like for you to see Scott Morrison talking about, we're going to put on 1.25 million <laughs> jobs. Uh, do you feel a bit like, hey, we business people yeah, we are the ones hiring you. Exactly, <laughs> right. Not. Um, I, yeah. I think that it is unlikely. I don't think that, like probably most Australians, whether I'm a CEO or not, I don't believe it because it's just more false promises. And it's just quite sad that, unfortunately, the, you know, I guess the Prime Minister can go out there and make claims that I go, not going to happen, not going to happen, not going to happen. <laughs> they, they just haven't been able to get anything through for years. Yeah. So why all of a sudden are we going to start believe believing now? these, you know, crazy claims of how great things are going to be when they haven't been great for for the past few years. Yeah, and we showed a clip earlier of um, the assistant treasurer on, in an interview with David Spears on Sky News. He was mm. quizzed, oh, this $1.25 million jobs, is it uh, 1.25 million jobs, is it going to be full-time, part-time? And Stuart Roberts said, oh, full-time, like the last million. And David Spears says, no, about half actually was mm. part-time. And he says, well, you know, we're committed to the big picture. And it was just like, At bob, a time bob, when bob, bob, more and more jobs I mean, are being, are being always, automated, the, the technology is starting to take jobs off many, yep. Um, yep. many current workers. And I just don't think that anyone believes it, including mm. myself. When you consider that Australia's had the longest run of economic growth recorded by any nation <laughs> in modern times, and we've done that during a period where our politics has been more like watching the bold and the beautiful, you can't really claim as a politician to be responsible for that jobs growth. Uh, I remember one of the first yes. stories I covered uh, when I became a journalist was uh, uh, seeing Joe Hockey come out and he was, he was opening something and he was talking about how, as at the time, Human Services Minister, he was one of the largest employers in Australia. And I could hear people, people laugh. scoffing, laughing at him. 
because he's not an employer. He so wasn't true. an employer. That was our money funding those jobs. Mm. So I think that they've, they've got an overinflated sense of their contribution and their ability to influence uh, the outcomes in our economy. Yeah, the idea is the government of the day can set the conditions under which their you know, businesses feel like they can hire and you know, invest. Do you see anything from either side, John? Well, Wayne, I'd like to see honesty decisions? and I'd like to see stability. Mm -hmm. And you know, for that reason, he'll probably get my vote just because I think as a nation we need to be stable. Mm -hmm. But let me tell you, if either side came out and was honest and showed any sort of sign of stability and you know, standing by their word and their promise, then they'd have my vote. But does that affect your hiring decisions? No. No, right? absolutely exactly. not. Exactly. Yeah. So what's going to what's what's either side offering for you know to to foster for the me, right conditions? For me, I think that my hiring hire decisions. We're hiring more people. You know, 100 people every year uh, currently on a business that's 800 employees. So. But that's coming on growth. It's having nothing to do with, yeah. the government, with what the government's doing. And in fact, I can give you a, a loads of roles, technology, for example, where we can't find people. I can't find um, young people that want to get into retail. So it's hard to hire retail jobs these days because young people want it all. And I don't think that they feel that retail is an aspirational um, yeah. industry or profession to be getting into. So I'd like to see better uh, pathways and education for the more technical roles, but equally an ability that um, allowed us to educate people on, uh, I guess, the industry of retail, which I don't think is very aspirational today. Yeah, good point. So when, so when you see a speech like today, you just sort of shake your head and, and do your best That's to right. ignore it, it's I just, guess. It's just another speech. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, it's just another political speech with no, you know, that has no weight behind it. Mm. Interesting. Speaking of things that the government is up to, right now the government is clamping down on the rich and famous' use of their own image. New rules would assure that income earned through sponsorships or paid social media posting are slugged with full income tax rates. So, uh, it kind of got us thinking, isn't it? You, you see a couple of these superstars doing it around the world, it's coming down under. Also an excuse to show Christiana. Ronaldo well, too, that too. Because <laughs> we like too. watching those pictures. Exactly. Yes. Um, <laughs> John Rolfe, what do you think? High time for this or, or is it a bit rough? Well, geez, I mean... Go easy on Cristiano. He had a bad week last week. He did, 30 didn't. mil, but he did manage to stay out of jail. Yeah. Um, <laughs> gee, he'd be going. I'm glad I'm not an Australian with this <laughs> this move by uh, th this move to crack down on income from social media. Look, I think everyone should pay their fair share of tax, and I think that if uh, you've got people who are able to dodge it, it uh, undermines overall confidence in the system, and then that leads other people to see how they can dodge it. It might be by paying cash for a plumber if they think other high-profile people people are not paying their way. So I think it's good for the overall integrity of the system and encourages people to pay their fair share because people of a profile are being seen to pay theirs. How much it will actually raise, oh, yeah, I, don't, I think it, it would be, you know, it would be a, a, a piddling amount, yeah. uh, to use a word that politicians tend to like to use. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm probably an interesting one to ask because I have a, a kind of left field view on this mm. and I'm a big advocate for saying that it should be a standardised tax rate and by doing that say call it 20 percent and there's studies around the world that actually say that it's the best way to actually collect tax because then what it does is it has people aspiring to be more successful and as they become more successful they actually aren't penalized by higher tax rates I know I was talking with a property developer only a few months ago who had had such a great successful first half of the year he actually said actually the markets changed a little bit it slowed down he's spending the entire last six months of his year working out how to minimize the tax on the profit that he'd made in the first six months of the year. Yep. Like what sort of government wants to have their very highly intelligent, highly successful people spending half their time trying to work out how to minimise their tax mm -hmm. rather than working on how to boost the economy even further, um, create more jobs and create more development for the economy. So for me, I think that it would be a really interesting scenario that if, and I pay all my tax, I'd probably spend less time than anyone I know trying to minimise my tax. And I can yes. certainly say that if I was you know, in any high tax bracket that I would probably start to consider that in the next five or yeah. ten years I'd have to move overseas um, because it would be not that yeah. favourable for me to be living in Australia and I can tell you if I was a famous in Instagram influ yeah. in influencer and didn't have 800 people that were relying on, on me to give them employment in Australia it would be much easier for me to take mm. that income and, uh, and move overseas. It's an interesting point John but surely a flat tax 
you know, there'd be a lot of people on the lower end of the income spectrum going, geez, 20%, I mean, or, or whatever it might well, be. With, would be with a flat rough. tax at 20%, what, what you'd probably have to do is have the universal basic income. That would, be, that would be my strategy, where everyone gets a universal basic income, whether you're making half a million dollars a year or whether you're making $15,000 a year, and that gets you started, and that eradicates all of, I guess, the... Uh, I guess the t um, the infrastructure and the costs mm. involved in managing um, welfare, and then from there, people would be uh, motivated to say, "Okay, well, I get the universal basic income, but then I can still earn a little bit on top." I know at the moment, if you wanted to go and earn twenty thousand dollars, you're probably much better off being on the dole. Mm. Um, whereas if you said that twenty that twenty thousand uh, dollars a year was on top of a universal basic income or like a dole type payment, yep. then it's always upside and it encourages people to go and earn that little bit. All right. Th That'd be part of a very large debate. We could have another I time. I could speak all night. Yeah, yeah. I think I've had a lot of <laughs> I feel like we've got to get you back on yeah. that one. Um, John, I want to go back to you, except for we've got to touch one more topic, which is around uh, networking and touching base over coffee. Is this yeah. a waste of your business hours? Networking, is it all it's really cracked up to be? A business insider has thrown out convention by arguing traditional networking methods amount to a lot of time, energy and money for not much career progression at all. Anyone agree with that? Oh... I found, like, I read this story, I thought it was, an, it was an interesting piece of journalism. I think as a journalist, <laughs> you're almost um, doing your networking by doing your job. And it may be also true for you, um, John, because you're out there um, dealing with people as a matter of course. And you're perhaps putting your, your wares out there and you're showing your skills just by doing the do. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't like to devote too much time to it. I think it's a bit like married at first sight a little bit goes a long way uh, with networking but I do think it's got a role to play I wouldn't say that networking is a is a, a terrible thing and I think even um, that particular reporter and, and in their experiment they still ended up doing some networking. <laughs> yeah that's true. true it's hard to kind of avoid we're, we're social beings aren't mm. we yeah well, I guess if you're not interested you're not interesting so I think that if you're out there and it feels like work to be networking then you probably shouldn't be doing it I know some people that absolutely love meeting new people love networking are really interested saying so what do you do where do you make your money where do you spend your time what's your interest and if you're one of those people that really enjoys conversing and getting to know new people then you're probably a great networker and if it comes naturally then I think you'll get a lot of benefit out of it if you feel like it's taking you away from being productive in your day-to-day -day life then it's probably not for you and I think you know if you're not interested then you're probably not interesting to the person you're trying to network with and I think that that'll come across really clearly and it'll be a waste of your time Correct. hey guys thank you so much for giving your time we very much appreciate <laughs> it and we love your views thank you Good John Rolf and so John Winning thank you guys